was trying to figure out who I was and how that could be fixed, something like that. I started to pay very careful attention to what I was saying. I don't know if that happened voluntarily or involuntarily, but I could feel a sort of split developing in my psyche. And the split, and I've actually had students tell me the same thing that has happened to them after they've listened to some of the material that, that I've been describing to all of you. But I split into two, let's say. And one part was the, let's say, the old me that was talking a lot and that liked to argue and that liked ideas. And there was another part that was watching that part, like just with its eyes open and neutrally judging. And the part that was neutrally judging was watching the part that was talking and going, that isn't your idea. You don't really believe that. You don't really know what you're talking about. That isn't true. And I thought, hmm, that's really interesting. So now I've, and that was happening to like 95% of what I was saying. And so then I didn't really know what to do. I thought, okay, this is strange. So maybe I've, I've fragmented and that's just not a good thing at all. I mean, it wasn't like I was hearing voices or anything like that. I mean, it wasn't like that. It was, it was well, people have multiple parts. So then I had a, this weird conundrum. It was like, well, which of these two things are me? Is it the part that's listening and saying, no, that's rubbish, that's a lie, that's, you're doing that to impress people, you're just trying to win the argument, you know. Was that me, or was the part that was going about my normal verbal business me? And I didn't know, but I decided I would go with the critic. And then what I d tried to do, what I learned to do, I think, was to stop saying things that made me weak. And that, that I mean, I'm still trying to do that, because I'm always feeling, when I talk, whether or not the words that I'm saying are either making me align or making me come apart. And I think the alignment, I really do think the alignment is, is, I think alignment is the right way of conceptualizing it because I think if you say things that are as true as you can say them, let's say, then they come up, they come out of the depths inside of you. Because well, we don't know where thoughts come from. We don't know how far down into your substructure the thoughts emerge. We don't know what processes of physiological alignment are necessary for you to speak from the core of your being. We don't understand any of that. We don't even conceptualize that. But I believe that you can feel that. And I learned some of that from reading Carl Rogers, by the way, who's a great clinician. Uh, because he talked about mental health in part as a coherence between the... The, the, the spiritual or the, or the abstract and the physical, that the two things were aligned. And, and there's a lot of idea of alignment in, in psychoanalytic and clinical thinking. But anyways, I decided that I would start practicing not saying things that would make me weak. And what happened was that I had to stop saying almost everything that I was saying. I would say 95% of it. It's a hell of a shock to wake up and... I mean, this was over a few months, but it's a hell of a shock to wake up and realize that you're mostly dead wood. It's a shock. You know, and you might think, well, do you really want all of that to burn off? It's like, well, there's nothing left but a little husk, 5% of you. It's like, well, if that 5% is solid, then maybe that's exactly what you want to have happen. Well, so, I told you that story is an elaboration of this line. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagine of the th imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It's a question worth asking. Just exactly what are your motives? Well, you know, maybe they're purer than mine were. And it's certainly possible. I don't think that I'm naturally a particularly good person. I think I have to work at it very, very hard. And I don't necessarily think that everyone is like that. But some people are worse than that, and everyone's like that to some degree. So it's worth thinking about. Just how much trouble are you trying to cause? You know, and the other thing you might think about is that if you're not doing something important with your life, by your own definition, because that's the game that we're playing, you get to define the terms, at least initially. Maybe you're prone to cause trouble just because you don't have anything better to do. Because at least it's, trouble is more interesting than boring. You know, that's something you learn if you read Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky knew that extraordinarily well. And so if you're not doing something, if you're not pushing yourself to the limits of your capacity, then you have plenty of leftover, um, what would you say, willpower, energy, and resources to devote to causing interesting trouble. And so, 
Also, I would say this is also an archetypal scenario. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's something to meditate on. And it's not self destructive because what it is is an attempt to it's like the diagnosis of an illness it's like if that does happen to be the case for you or to some degree maybe it's only 10% of you or something or maybe it's 90% well then coming to terms with that is excellent because then maybe you can stop doing it and what would be the downside to that you'd have to give up your resentment obviously and your hatred and all of that and that's really annoying because those emotions are very they're easy to engage in and they're and they're engaging and they have this feeling of self-righteousness with them and that goes along with them but you're not doing this in order to put yourself down you're doing this in order to separate the wheat from the chaff and to leave everything that you don't have to be behind 